Hi, everyone. Thanks, Derek uh, and uh, BCH and the JCC for putting this on. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me virtually from afar. I appreciate everyone tuning into this. Um, uh, it's true, I, I'm an OBGYN at BCH, uh, and I do specialize in uh, this whole topic that we're going to discuss today. So. Um, pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, prolapse, bladder problems that we'll talk about uh, is something that I have um, a special interest in and is a big problem, uh, which I think is the reason that so many people have signed on to listen to this today and that these lectures have been so well attended in the past. It's a, it's a big problem. It's a very undertreated problem. There's not nearly enough uh, information out there for patients uh, with regard to what's going on with these issues, and there's not nearly enough physicians that do uh, treat these problems. So hopefully this is some valuable information. Uh, I'm going to try to stay put at my podium, and I can't really uh, use a laser pointer, so I may occasionally uh, move the cursor on the screen, uh, but I'll try to keep my explanations useful and not need to do that. Uh, we're going to cover a range of topics today. Um, but I did want to say, reiterate what, what Derek had started with, is that um, I do work out of an office at BCH, Boulder Women's Care. We have a number of great OBGYN physicians. We uh, do, do obstetric care and deliver babies, uh, as well as kind of offer a full range of evaluation for GYN problems, including these. We are, we have gone through a time of seeing absolutely no patients in the office uh, as COVID landed upon us, uh, and we're extremely careful for a long time. We, in the past few weeks, have started to see more patients um, in the office in a very safe and careful way. So I do think that uh, it's true that you should feel safe to come into the office for these uh, problems. Um, I, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways the office feels a lot safer to me than the supermarket sometimes. And, we're meticulous about safety around there. So I just want to empower you guys that if, if this information sounds relevant and like something that you really want to get dealt with, uh, please reach out and uh, come in for a visit if that sounds comfortable to you. I also would be happy to kind of start this process by uh, answering questions over the phone, maybe having some kind of virtual visit just to get things started because it's really, as a lot of you know, these are problems that are really painful to sit around with. Uh, not knowing when you can get help. So I appreciate Derek mentioning that. I don't have any financial disclosures at all. Uh, our agenda for today uh, is that the general topic that we're going to discuss is indeed pelvic floor dysfunction. That's kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different types of problems. We're going to discuss a couple things. Um, I think a couple of the biggest problems within that today. But there are other issues that kind of fall under that category that we're not going to discuss today that definitely deserve a lot of attention on their own. So the biggest problems within this topic um, do include pelvic organ prolapse uh, is, is definitely one of the big ones we are going to talk about today. Prolapse is a term that I think some people have heard about in ways large and small or not at all. Uh, we'll get into it, but the, what that refers to very broadly is just the idea that pelvic support, the support of your pelvic floor becomes weak over time for one reason or another, and that bulges are allowed to happen, that that's part of your, your pelvic organs are allowed to kind of bulge down into the vagina, which is uncomfortable, and then causes a lot of problems along with it. So that, that's what prolapse refers to. Uh, either part and parcel with that or separately without any prolapse at all are certainly a lot of bladder issues that go along with pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic floor muscle weakness. And so we're going to definitely touch on those as well because that is definitely the most common symptom pattern that I talk about in the office every day is, is bladder problems, incontinence, urgency, uh, which is a big deal, as you guys know. It can absolutely dominate your life and and I'm happy to say, and I hope I impress upon you today, there's a lot of great solutions for this. Some other issues we're not going to talk about today include a lot of problems with bowel movements. Um, that definitely can deserve its own talk. And just issues with chronic pain and, and pain with intercourse, just pain problems that relate to the pelvic floor. So for each of these things, I'm going to move fairly quickly just because there's a lot here. Uh, but I do know 
the, which of these problems I know most of you guys are interested in hearing about, so I'm going to spend more time on, the, on the, the more prominent ones. But for each of these, I do want to be able to give to you what does each particular facet of this look like in terms of how does it show up in a person, what symptoms does someone have where we start thinking about these things, who is at risk for it if they're not experiencing it now based on certain risk factors. And then in terms, I do want to offer you the range of treatments for each of these things um, that are out there. And I, I am upfront with everyone I meet with in the clinic in saying that I am a surgeon and I do these surgeries for women, but I would prefer that everyone I meet not ever need a surgery. And it's not the first thing that I think any patient or provider should really jump to right away as far as these problems go. I think a lot of patients are one reason that they delay seeking treatment for these problems, although there's a number of reasons for that, is that I think that they're worried that the only solution is a big surgery, which is not the case. And if that ever is the first thing that's being presented to you, I don't think that's the right way to deal with this. So what I am going to give to you is a number of solutions and places to start that are very conservative, that are places where you can start on your own to work on your own strength and to heal yourself before we involve a lot of medicine. Um, but I will present some of those surgeries ultimately as well. I don't, you know, I think there's a place for those too. And, and as a lot of you know, these problems can be significant. And for some people, when conservative treatments fail, some of these surgeries can be absolute life improvers and I think should definitely be talked about. So just to start with a couple very broad things, the pelvic floor that I'm going to refer to a million times is a lot more complicated than I think one might assume. You know, people hear about this pelvic bowl or your, the pelvic floor that just kind of holds things in the right place as maybe one unit. Uh, and it is a very complicated structure. It is a combination of as many as 22 different muscles that come together in a very complicated arrangement with, with connective tissue that holds them to the bony pelvis, which is a very complicated thing in and of itself. And there are about a million ways that this can go wrong in ways large and small. And so I do, I think sometimes these problems seem annoying and, and small in some way, but you know, I want to communicate to you that they're real and they can be complicated and they really deserve real attention. So what is this dysfunction, pelvic floor dysfunction, PFD, that, that will be on a million of these slides is, I think one good definition of this is a range of issues that arise out of weakness or too much strength or spasm or discoordination of all these structures that make up the pelvic floor, quote unquote, which is a complex association of muscles, the connective tissue that anchor those muscles and organs to the pelvis. All right, let's get back to where I was and the organs that those connective tissues and muscles support physically and that allow them to work correctly. So uh, it is important and complicated. So just some quick statistics. I don't like to dwell on too much in terms of numbers, but the numbers are scary and real with this whole category. So pelvic floor dysfunction in one way or another um, affects one in four women as a general statistic. This factoid that uh, 50 percent of women over 50, 60 percent over 60, 70 percent over 70 suffer from some version of these problems is absolutely true. And if that sounds like that's just about everyone, that's uh, basically accurate. You know, these, these are very, very common problems. So 50 percent of, of women over 50 living every day with some of these, indeed. Uh, stress incontinence, which we'll definitely talk about, uh, is by far the most common symptom that people present with that we talk about. So that can be constant and majorly bothersome. You can hardly do any activity without some amount of leakage. Or maybe it's someone who really only has leaking of urine when they run or try to exercise. Uh, both are completely bothersome and fixable. One in three of those women who do have bladder problems will have some degree of legitimate bowel dysfunction too. Uh, very few people will talk about the bladder problem. No one will talk about the bowel movement problem. And they'll wait even longer to come in and talk to the doctor about that, which is OK. And, I, and that is, I think, something that happens because society also just tells women that these problems are part of the territory somehow. If you've had some kids and you're of, of a certain age, some of these problems are going to happen. But I'm telling you that does not need to be the truth. It is not the fair truth. And they are fixable. 
60% uh, of nursing home occupants at least suffer from daily incontinence issues. There's a 20% overall lifetime risk of needing surgery for these problems for all women. So one in five was a huge number to have a legitimate surgery for this. And surgical repair for prolapse is the most common surgery happening for women that are older than 70. So those are all kind of hospital statistics. There's many that mean much more to real people in their homes, and that is that thousands upon thousands of dollars and time and stress and hours of sleep lost are spent on these problems. Um, at least 300 million, that was only in 2006. So it's a big problem that reaches a lot of different places. As a punchline, it is very common and most people do suffer silently with it. So there's some really great resources that I'll reference um, that you guys can, can and really should look at on the internet for some great communities for um, pelvic floor dysfunction. I think hearing some of these stories from other patients is really helpful, uh, just to hear what other people are going through in terms of symptoms, what they've done for treatments, what's worked for them. And I hear these comments absolutely every day. Well, I mean, I've had these symptoms for years, but I didn't really know there was anything I could really do about them or I didn't know there was anything I could do short of having a big procedure. I get it, I had a couple kids, I assume that some amount of leaking was just part of the deal. Or I enjoy sex with my partner, I do, but the truth be, but truth be told is it is a little painful most of the time and has been that way for a long time. So these are all real and reasonable things that people go through and, and we can address them. So, as I kind of said in the beginning, there are four general areas where uh, pelvic floor dysfunction affects women, and we're gonna talk about these two. So prolapse, the physical problem of prolapse, and then we're gonna focus on issues related to the bladder. As I said, bowel movement issues and, and chronic pain as a separate item are very important and deserve a whole other lecture. So we're gonna start with prolapse. And initially I'm gonna switch to a video, which I, I think is, uh, helpful to really kind of explain and visualize what's going on. Prolapse is a weird problem for people to think about and to wrap their heads around what's going on physically in the body and for doctors as well. And so I do think that a video ultimately is, is kind of helpful. So I'm gonna press play here. There's some narration with this uh, and it just lasts about a minute and then we'll switch back. As previously mentioned, the vagina can be separated into three different sections or compartments, anterior or front, posterior or back, and central or top. Normal support of each vaginal section contributes to the support of other organs. Note that the vagina is bordered by the bladder, rectum, and uterus at each of the sections. Loss of support of the front or anterior vaginal compartment can result in the bladder descending or falling into the vaginal canal and sometimes through the vaginal opening. This is also known as cystocele. Similarly, loss of support of the back or posterior vaginal compartment can result in the displacement of the rectum into the vaginal canal and sometimes through the vaginal opening. This is also known as rectocele. Lastly, loss of support of the top or central compartment of the vagina can lead to a downward displacement of the cervix and uterus into the vaginal canal or through the vaginal opening. This is called uterovaginal prolapse. Women who have had their uterus removed in a surgery called a hysterectomy can also experience loss of support of the top compartment of the vagina. This is known as post-hysterectomy vaginal vault prolapse. In these cases, portions of the small intestines can often be found just above the prolapsed vaginal walls. It is common for the different sections of the vagina to lose support simultaneously. So, I think that can be a, a little creepy and startling uh, as a video, but I do, you know, that, that type of thing, it happens a lot and it, and, it, and it can happen to small degrees for women and, they, and they, they don't know it in particular, they don't know what that feeling is. And, you know, certainly if anyone has had a lot of, 
you know, some experience with prolapse themselves or, the, or a loved one. Significant prolapse is very obvious and there's nothing subtle about it, but um, earlier stages of prolapse where they all begin and arise from are, uh, you know, these bulges that are, that are smaller, that are starting and that are kind of still within the vagina are, it's really hard for women to feel that a lot of times or really understand what it is. So it is true that it's, it's difficult to start to get to the solution without seeing a provider that can help you figure this out because uh, it's really hard to detect it on your own and to kind of do the work to figure it out. And, and this is about, this section is about prolapse, but I, I don't want women who are listening to this talk wanting to address their leaking while they're running to be like, geesh, you know, do I have that going on? Do I definitely have that going on? Which is not necessarily the case. You know, you def as I said, you definitely can have isolated bladder problems that don't have a major anatomic component, but the truth is there's a lot of women who just have the symptom of bladder leaking of all ages is true. And they do have some degree of prolapse that we need to find and we need to talk about um, as part of the solution for the whole problem. So this is just a slide uh, reiterating uh, what was in that video. Uh, as, it's, as it said, the way I kind of describe this to patients is that there are uh, three different types of bulges and three different types of prolapse that can happen. And they're related to problems with three different areas of support in the vagina. The vagina is kind of the central component of this system, which is why gynecologists uh, have fallen into this role of kind of being the ones who end up starting to talk about this problem because um, these bulges and the physicality of them show themselves in the vagina. So, Loss of support of the anterior top wall of the vagina, I'm gonna use my cursor briefly, um, does, when that becomes weak, that gives rise to a cystocele, which is what women, everyone calls the bladder falling down. Uh, that is, the, that anterior top wall support is the one that's most really commonly injured by childbirth and, and thus uh, childbirth and pregnancy being one of the, the most obviously common risk factors. Um, that is one of the most common types of prolapse that we see. A lot of people assume that it might be an injury posteriorly uh, during childbirth. That's commonly where women have maybe some stitches after delivery, that kind of thing. That that would be the thing, the part that's the most insulted by delivery, but it actually is the anterior wall leading to cystocele. The second type of uh, prolapse is the idea that the support that's supposed to hold the uterus up inside the pelvis, higher up in the pelvis, becomes weak over time, and the uterus is allowed to prolapse down into the vagina. That is called uterine prolapse or uterovaginal prolapse in the video. And then a third level of support is what makes up the posterior or bottom wall of the vagina, and that can become weak, certainly, and give rise to a rectocele. Um, and that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the symptoms briefly that go along with these bulges, but you would imagine a cystocele definitely has some bladder components to it. A rectocele has issues with difficult or painful bowel movements. And then uterine prolapse, because the uterus is, is really kind of a solid organ, a solid item that's prolapsing down in the vagina. That really feels like something is not right in the vagina to those women, you know, like something is not in its right place. So risk factors for prolapse, the most common ones are in that first line. So pregnancies are related to prolapse, it's true, uh, but you absolutely can have prolapse if you've never been pregnant once in your life. There's definitely a genetic component that goes along with these problems and you'll hear about families where the women have all suffered from these problems, similarly pregnancy or not. But pregnancies are implicated, age is definitely implicated as we talked about. Obesity and chronic constipation, I think maybe people wouldn't immediately connect the dots on that, but both of those problems are ones where there is extra pressure down on your pelvic floor every day of your life. So obesity, women that carry more weight, this is true of men too, that every day is pressure down on your pelvic floor that's pushing things in the wrong direction. Chronic constipation, obviously straining, and sometimes straining painfully and hard for bowel movements every day of your life or whatever also is definitely a risk factor for prolapse. Those first two are, address, are not addressable, can't reverse time, and we would not wanna give back our kids most of the time. Obesity and chronic constipation are reversible, and there's big things that we can do for both of those and make a huge impact on these problems. 
Though as far as pregnancy goes, vaginal delivery is more related to prolapse and prolapse problems than C-sections, if you've had all your babies by C-sections. But, but women who have delivered all their babies by C-section definitely can have these problems too. It is hard for your pelvic floor to hold up a baby and the uterus for 40 weeks. It's, a, it's stressful and it's, that's why it's connected. BMI even greater than 25 carries a twofold risk, two, twofold increased risk of having these problems. And we'll talk about it in treatments, and it's a lame doctor thing to say, but it is absolutely true that weight loss is a great improvement for these problems. Pound for pound, every pound that you lose, you will see an improvement in some of these symptoms. Uh, hysterectomy, if you've had a hysterectomy in the past, are you at an increased risk for prolapse? And historically, that has been true, and, that is, and, I, and it is really unclear how that's evolved over time. It does seem that the rates of prolapse following hysterectomy are lessening. Um, I think that's because the way surgeons are trained these days, we have more, we pay more attention to, to recreating the support of the pelvis as we do a, t a normal hysterectomy. Uh, but there definitely has historically been a concern that um, having a hysterectomy can increase your risk for prolapse in the future. So how does prolapse present itself? There's really two categories to these symptoms. One is the physicality of the bulge itself, and that that may feel painful, that it might feel like vaginal fullness or pressure, it might feel like something is literally in the vagina that's not supposed to be there. Um, so there's just the physicality of that difference. And then there's always an associated problem of whatever organ is behind the bulge that is now out of its normal position and not functioning normally. So, we touched on these briefly, but with a cystocele and with your bladder prolapsing down into the vagina, that goes along with a whole host of bladder problems. Uh, these, there is not always a, it's not always the same. There's not always a linear progression for every woman about which of these show up when and in what order. But uh, I think the way this often starts is that women notice just kind of dysfunctional voiding, like they just need to sit and wait and dance around and move a little bit on the toilet just to be able to pee normally. That kind of dovetails into doing all that, but then ultimately just not feeling like you emptied completely for some reason. You stand up, realize you need to sit back down and go again, so we call that double voiding. Uh, also, women needing to actually press up on the top wall of the vagina and almost just like move something back into the right place to be able to pee and empty their bladder is called splinting. Uh, we have a name for it because it's so common and I'm sure feels really strange to have to do that. But that is very, very common and definitely related to a cystocele. Aside from those kind of logistical, functional problems, we definitely can get into incontinence issues with when you have bladder prolapse. And that can be either urgency or stress incontinence. And we're going to talk about a lot about incontinence uh, discreetly, but either of those issues can go along with that. With a rectocele, so separately, po oppositely on the posterior wall, having a bulge that kind of takes the rectum out of its normal path on the way out really changes the course of things for normal bowel movement. So those, that can be difficult, odd, painful bowel movements. Needing to splint down posteriorly to be able to have a bowel movement is also very, very common. Um, and having incontinence issues with stool is definitely a thing too. And so that, those are all things that are related to cystocele. So those are the four types. Um, the, well, there are three types, and then there's very often, there's four pictures here, normal, three types of prolapse. And I would say even a fourth in addition to this is that a combination of one, two, or all three of these is very common. And the one that's associated with a leaky bladder, as per the title of this talk, is definitely a cystocele. And this is just another picture of kind of how that looks. So that was prolapse. Let's go on and just talk a little bit about presentation and symptoms of bladder issues specifically. Uh, these can be many. And so I, I do want to say again, like these can happen on their own when you don't have prolapse. So you can just have these isolated bladder problems, which can also be uh, completely bothersome and also fixable uh, outside of prolapse. So these bladder issues on their own are broadly in, in four categories. One is issues with urinary incontinence. Two is issues of urinary retention, not being able to pee fully and retaining urine chronically. Uh, recurrent bladder infections or urinary tract infections is three. And then just having pain associated with your bladder, associated with voiding, 
chronic pain that we can't figure out that actually is related to your bladder is also very common. So just to talk about incontinence, which may be one of the most popular reasons that someone's tuning into this, there are broadly three types of urinary incontinence. Um, stress incontinence, urgency, or urgent incontinence, and then overflow incontinence. Uh, ultimately, the first and second type, stress and urge, are by far the most common that affect the vast majority of people that I will talk to in the office. Um, overflow incontinence is definitely a thing, but it is, it is that particular type of incontinence is an issue where you, usually due to traumatic injuries, accidents, neurological problems, systemic neurological problems, your bladder loses and your body loses the ability to really sense how full your bladder is getting all the time. And so your bladder can and does fill all the way up to full capacity. And then you start to have leaking because the bladder literally cannot hold any more urine. And that's where your incontinence is coming from. So that, as you can tell, that's ultimately a, 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 that's a significant, but that's a pretty rare cause, which I don't think most people should worry about. The vast majority of people will have one of the first two. So it is important for you to think about in terms of your symptoms and for us to talk about in the office which of these two is the more bothersome component for you, whether it's stress leaking or urgency. And they are, they do occur for different reasons. You know, stress incontinence is something that I, I think more people have heard about stress incontinence. Having leaking when you laugh, cough, sneeze, jump on a trampoline, uh, walk upstairs, exercise. That sounds like, and it is, an issue of just, for some reason, not having the muscular strength to hold back urine when you're doing something that requires you to hold it back. The second type, urgency, is actually a totally different problem with a different presentation and a different reason behind it. And so, with urge and urgency, this is kind of in a continuum with overactive bladder. You can be sitting there doing absolutely nothing, sitting in the middle of the kitchen, minding your own business, and someone can turn on the faucet or something, and the urge to go to the bathroom hits you so quickly that you just cannot get there and get your pants down fast enough. So that is a bladder spasm, that's overactive bladder, that's urgency, and having accidents in that context is what urge incontinence refers to. So I'm not gonna explain all this, but this is just a picture to explain to you that, that like the pelvic floor is complex, the systems that go into allowing us to like recognize that we need to go to the bathroom, get to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, is not nearly as simple as it might seem. It is complicated, it is regulated on a number of different levels from your brain down to your bladder. There are a number of different places where things can go wrong and, and there are a number of places where we can have interventions that fix problems. But I, I, I kind of want to reinforce the idea that these are not just silly, annoying problems, that it's, it's just annoying that you have it. Like these, these are complicated and deserve real attention. So I do want to focus on stress incontinence. I, as I said, I think this is probably one of the most common reasons that people are tuning in. So in terms of risk factors for stress incontinence, pregnancies are, are definitely implicated. Same thing, vaginal delivery is more implicated than C-section, but both are involved. Um, age, as with all incontinence, uh, definitely increases with increasing age. One big component of this is menopause. Uh, the lack of estrogen that happens after menopause really negatively affects everything in this whole area. Uh, not all, the lack of estrogen leads to your muscles literally not being as strong and getting as much blood flow, uh, which kind of leads to incontinence from a muscle perspective. Um, there's just the, the tissues of the area lose their vitality and elasticity. Uh, there's just a bunch of things that menopause does that is not helpful for this whole topic. Um, obesity, absolutely implicated with stress incontinence. And then also bladder irritants is something that we'll talk about in terms of any type of incontinence, stress incontinence, but it's, it's even more implicated in urgency. So we'll get into it, but that's the idea of coffee, alcohol, sugar, all things that are really great that do make all of our bladders more uh, spazzy and more overactive and they can uh, exacerbate all incontinence. So stress incontinence in terms of presentation, um, as I said, I think most people have some understanding of this. Um, leaking when you're doing something that requires you to hold back urine, cough, sneeze, laugh, that kind of thing. Also, the story of I was trying to get off the plane and I just started to lose urine and I, I, I emptied almost my whole bladder, it was terrible. 
is a story that's, in, that's akin to stress incontinence um, or a combination of stress and urge. Other symptoms that are kind of in this family, uh, which are less common but really important to focus on, one is that uncontrollable loss of urine, both insensible or uncontrollable. Um, having leakage of urine at night while you're asleep, called anuresis, is, is, is an important one for us to talk about. And incontinence with sexual intercourse are all related to the same pathology. So urge incontinence, just to switch gears to that second type, uh, is a spectrum of problems that arises from the bladder being too spazzy, too overactive. And that, the lar as that picture describes, the broadest category of that, which more people suffer with, is just frequency. Uh, I just go into the bathroom 50 times a day. I always need to know where a bathroom is when we're driving or when I'm hiking and I need to go find a tree and I pee all day at work. That whole family of complaints, obviously very disruptive, uh, is, relate, is, is related to urgency and is part of the same problem that we can fix. Um, similarly, getting up five times at night, very annoying, very fixable, part of the same problem. That is a bladder that is, that is overactive. Uh, that kind of degrades or evolves into true urgency, like I said, these urge accidents. Um, and as the last category, actually losing urine because those bladder spasms are so frequent or so strong that you can't hold it back. Um, is in the same family. So for risk factors for urge incontinence, uh, largely overlapping with stress incontinence, but definitely different. We, you know, we're thinking of things that, that fill up the bladder too much and that make the bladder too spazzy. So obesity does definitely apply to both. Obesity is definitely related to urgency as well. Drinking habits is a big deal. So uh, we'll give you some more tips about that. But uh, the amount of water that you drink every day definitely has a big uh, implication on urgency. Uh, the punchline of that is that too little water drinking uh, you might think might be helpful for urgency, but actually your urine is always very concentrated when you don't drink enough water, and that leads to more spasms. Conversely, drinking way too much water, which I think is a more common problem, especially in Colorado, it's dry and it's hot, uh, is also not helpful for urgency. A bladder that's overfilled and stretched all the time, uh, you'll definitely have more issues with urgency. Smoking on its own, because it's a bladder irritant, but also definitely on its own, is a big problem with urgency. And then bladder irritants um, are very important. So uh, prolapse, this is true with stress incontinence too, but uh, prolapse is, is really an important thing to evaluate for with urgency. And specifically, if you have had prolapse and you've had a fix for prolapse in the past, maybe you've had a surgery, maybe you've had an incontinence sling, it is, it is common to have issues with urgency arise years later after you've had a fix for some other type of prolapse or incontinence. So that's an important thing for me to ask you guys about when we're talking about this. There is a family history uh, kind of genetic component to urgency that is not quite as much there with stress incontinence. Um, there is, you know, these twin studies suggest that there's a strong correlation between twins suggesting that there uh, is a real genetic component to this. And also, lastly, if you are someone who has struggled with recurrent urinary tract infections for whatever reason, um, that insult and irritation and inflammation of the bladder over and over again uh, is something that can lead to urgency down the line, having had multiple UTIs. So the presentation, I think we've talked about frequency, urgency, bladder spasms. But this urgency and this category of problems, really, this kind of dovetails into chronic pain related to the bladder or painful voiding. Uh, a, a, an overactive, spazzy bladder is, is an uncomfortable bladder. So I don't mean to be a bummer, but this uh, is a good list of bladder irritants, um, which are all really fantastic things, I can admit. Uh, the biggest offenders, so first of all, you don't need to cut all these things out if you're trying to fix this problem at all, but it is worth some detective work about whether or not any of them are a major part of your daily life, whether that's coffee times many every morning, whether that's sugar, artificial sweeteners, carbonated beverages, that, you know, there's quite a few things on this list that I think a lot of us are guilty of indulging in frequently. So the biggest offenders are alcohol, sugar and artificial sweeteners, 
and citrus, I would say, are the ones that, that come up the most. Um, and citrus being the one out of all those that maybe kind of sounds the most healthy or the most acceptable, but uh, some people find that, that although lemonade is great, uh, they didn't realize it, but it has a huge implication on what their bladder is doing. So let's move into some treatments. Um, for each of these, I'd like to go through quickly, as I said in the beginning, some conservative, some lifestyle things you can do on your own, some conservative quasi-doctorish things that I would recommend that we can do past what you can do in your own home. And then I'll talk about what procedures or, or more medical interventions there are for each of these things. So we're gonna start with prolapse. Lifestyle uh, fixes that go along with prolapse. One is that we have to correct any reversible risk factors that are there that led to prolapse in the first place. So as we said, weight loss, smoking, constipation, if those things are there, we have to figure out a solution for that. Otherwise, we can talk all day and try solutions for this six ways from Saturday, but if we don't fix those things, the problem will either not get fixed ever or it will come back after we find a solution. So those things are really very important. And a, a, a second thing for prolapse and something that you're gonna see come up in a few of these slides about solutions is that pelvic physical therapy in terms of, of, so this is an idea of doing Kegels, but the Kegels that we've all heard about, that we may all do at home or at the red stoplight where we just kind of squeeze everything and relax, which is great, is not nearly as good as we can do with a, with a specialized practitioner, a physical therapist who has special training just in this. These are women who almost categorically help women at clinics just devoted to women with pelvic floor problems, and they are amazingly helpful for these problems. Um, so they can help with a lot of different things. Strengthening pelvic support, tricks and tools to improve function of bladder and bowel, and addressing pain. So I do want to empower you guys to think about pelvic PT. It is something I almost always recommend to anyone who has any of these problems. I think it is one of the most valuable things I can recommend for this whole talk. Uh, there are a lot of different um, resources on how to find a good pelvic PT person. There are a few that I've worked with a lot that I think are really fabulous in this area. And I think that a referral um, from me to one of these clinics is, is a really valuable thing. And you know, one thing is a lot of people say that they've done Kegels for years, which, as I said, which is good, and it is, it is probably helped in some ways. But the truth is that for a lot of these problems, we don't just need to squeeze and strengthen everything. They, you know, this is complicated. We have to strengthen some muscles often, learn how to relax other muscles, bring all these muscles into balance. It is a, it is a nuanced practice that these guys can help you figure out. Um, and especially with, you know, I, I assume there's probably a lot of athletes and runners that are here asking about these questions. And that, you know, athletes and a lot of women even who aren't athletic have tight, already have tight pelvic floors that have actually kind of led to some of these problems. And for some people, just doing Kegels at home and not seeking better help with this might actually be working in the wrong direction. So um, I am a fan of Kegels and of exercising your pelvic floor, but for, we need to figure out how to do it the right way, and pelvic PT is a great way to do that. So conservative treatments for prolapse. The only thing that's, that's in the office in this category is the idea of a pessary, and then also the idea of being on, on vaginal estrogen um, is also really helpful for prolapse. So as far as pessaries go, uh, you know, I, I think Perhaps some people have heard about pessaries before or have known someone or a family member who has had a pessary. These have been around for a long time. They are not very fancy and they seem very weird to most people, but they are really great is the truth. And I, I recommend them to women of all ages, new moms in their 30s, older women who are having issues with prolapse. And they can be really versatile and really usable and they can be a lifelong solution to these problems that would allow you to never need surgery or to use it during a time when your muscles are getting stronger because you're doing your exercises, and then ultimately you might not need to use the pessary anymore, and we've really gone a long way to fix your problem. So there is a different, those shapes look very odd, I'm sure, and the, the deal is that there is a different shape of pessary for each different type of prolapse, and our goal when we try to find one in the office, which is a fairly straightforward process of trying one or two of them and seeing if they work, 
is to find the smallest possible pessary that does the job for you. And the idea is that when that pessary is in, you don't feel it at all. Wouldn't even really know that it's there. But due to the shape of it and the size of it, it holds your prolapse and everything back up exactly where it's supposed to be and, and functionally allows you to get back to normal. They are ultimately not too different than diaphragms used to be when they were popular for birth control. They're easy to take out and put back in for almost all patients. Uh, the incidence of infection and problems with these is really low, so I do think it's a really valuable tool. Um, the idea of estrogen is also really good. As I said, menopause and the lack of estrogen negatively affects this whole topic. And the idea of being on a vaginal cream or a tablet of bioidentical estradiol um, is really helpful for this. And just the one thing to say about that is that the, the, because vaginal estrogen is really not absorbed into your bloodstream significantly at all, there are almost no systemic risks from being on vaginal estrogen. So it is a different conversation than hormone replacement therapy and taking estrogen by mouth or be, being on a patch and the concerns that go along with that. So really safe, really effective. Lastly, uh, procedures that are there for prolapse. Uh, these are the most common types of surgeries that I do, and it is true that for someone with really significant prolapse, or maybe we've tried a pessary and exercises, sometimes the conservative things don't work, and that's fine. And I appreciate it when people want to try the conservative things first, but prolapse, significant prolapse can be a major bother, and these procedures, as I said, can be absolute life improvers for some women. So this you know, obviously there's a lot of different types of prolapse. The surgeries that go into fixing prolapse can be different and are kind of customized for every patient. Ultimately, we need to reestablish the support in whatever area you've lost it. So the picture here, and I didn't want to include too many creepy surgical pictures, but this is an example of how we would fix just a cystocele. So just the bladder that's bulging down from the top. Uh, and the principles of the surgery apply to how we fix most other types of prolapse is that that, when we do that surgery, we really just bring back the vaginal tissue that's over the top of the bulge. That second picture um, is where I try to find where the, that connected tissue that used to be strong and together and holding everything in the right place has become distended and attenuated over time and stretched out to allow the bulge to come through. My job is to find your own connective tissue, not using any permanent mesh, and bring that connective tissue back together and resupport the bladder using your own stuff. And so I do that with dissolvable suture, which ultimately goes away completely, but your body scars all that work into place, and now you have the strong support back underneath your bladder where it was supposed to be. So that's an entirely vaginal surgery, as are almost all of these, uh, which have really quite fast recoveries. Um, many of them, you don't need to stay in the hospital any number of nights at all. Um, what some, if there's an, a, a problem with uterine prolapse or if, kind of the, if, it's, if it's a complex problem where there's prolapse in a couple different areas, sometimes, but definitely not always, it is important to do a hysterectomy at the same time. If that does need to be the case, I, I just I think it's good to remind women that that does, has no r meaning that we need to remove your ovaries. Um, we can definitely just kind of address the support problems and not do anything with that. So for premenopausal women, that would mean, that does not mean menopause. That does not mean your hormones are gonna change one bit, uh, but we can just address the problem that's there. So <clears throat> moving on to bladder problems, I wanna talk about urgency first <clears throat> and uh, initially lifestyle problem, lifestyle fixes that go along with urgency. So as you can tell from the, the risk factor list, bladder irritants, smoking, uh, there's a big component of addressing these risk factors for treating urgency. So weight loss is definitely important. Absolutely avoiding bladder irritants is, is unfortunately a big deal with uh, treating urgency. And something that I always do in the office is, have, is, is as when I talked about detective work, it is not always so straightforward that it's just two pots of coffee every morning and there's your answer. So doing avoiding diary about, you know, just doing this over the course of a few days about how much water you drink, when do you drink it, when do you have your problem, you know, that is dorky but really helpful for trying to figure out what's going on with these problems. It is definitely true that pelvic PT is really helpful for urgency. They have some really fascinating tools uh, that are ver very outside of the norm to help you learn 
how your brain talks to your bladder and how to short circuit that urgency using it, things like biofeedback um, and tricks like that that they can teach you to stop that cycle from happening when someone turns on that faucet. In terms of conservative fixes for bladder urgency, the big thing in this category is the idea of medications. <clears throat> and I think if, if you guys have this problem and you've Googled it a little bit or talked to some doctors who either know a little or a lot about it, these medicines come up pretty quickly because they are a quick fix for the problem. Uh, you know, the problem with bladder urgency globally is that the bladder is too spazzy. There are medicines that can stop that, that can settle the bladder down. So by taking one of these pills every day, and you know, I'm not a fan of, and nobody wants to take more medicine or any medicine at all, but is it nice to have a, a, a medication once a day that's a pill that's fairly well tolerated that can dramatically improve this problem? Yeah, it is nice to have. So by taking one of these every day, we often go from crazy frequency 50 times a day down to something much less. We go from up 10 times at night to once, not at all. Urge accidents to no longer any accidents. So, is it important to try the lifestyle things first and eliminate bladder irritants, et cetera? Yes, absolutely. But is there a role for these medications for people that have tried those and et cetera? Yeah, definitely. So this is something that we can talk about in the office. It's, a, it's really a nice thing to have. In terms of procedures for overactive bladder, I'm not gonna talk about that because ultimately there, there are some really interesting things like pacemakers for your bladder and some uh, procedures that kind of address the spasticity of the bladder, but those are definitely done by specialists and I'm happy to say that most people don't really need to venture down that path. So treatments for stress leaking, I'm sure is something that most people are pretty interested in with this talk. So in terms of lifestyle things to address stress leaking first, it is, as I said, I, I feel bad about it, and I don't wag my finger about weight loss too much in clinic, but if it relates to anything, it relates to improving stress leaking. So this is definitely true that pound for pound weight loss will improve stress symptoms big time. Um, we have to address prolapse if that's there along with stress leaking, um, and, and as we've heard before, avoiding bladder irritants and avoiding constipation. Pelvic PT, this might be one of the clearest examples of where PT is really great. The problem with stress leaking, as we've talked about, is a muscle strength problem, and Kegels, or supporting, or, or what you learn at pelvic PT, and the many sphincters that go into this system in this picture, is a big part of the fix. So conservative solutions for, in the office, other things past that, that we can do. Um, is the idea of a pessary again for stress leaking. There are specific types of pessaries that are designed to stop stress incontinence. And so <clears throat> we've seen this picture on the left before. This picture on the right, which kind of describes some of these pessaries that have these bumps on them. These bumps are positioned in such a way that they provide support underneath the bladder and the urethra specifically to stop stress incontinence. And they're amazingly effective. Uh, because the problem, the anatomic problem with a lot of stress incontinence is one, the bladder is kind of falling down, but two, we're just lacking support in the specific area underneath the urethra. And so, especially for younger women who don't have significant prolapse, for instance, but they have a lot of issues with leaking while they're running, young moms who are trying to get back to exercising and are having issues with, with stress incontinence, I often try to get people to buy into the idea of a pessary that they can use very situationally, like just when they exercise, it will totally address leaking while they're exercising and you don't need to wear it any other hour of the day. It can be you know, cleaned off and thrown in the gym bag like anything else. So and that's not how a lot of people think about the idea of a pessary, but that is definitely a real thing. Something you can kind of experiment with uh, even before you come and see me is that Poise does make a product that's kind of like a tampon, which is called Impreza, which is, as an applicator, it's made out of the same material, but it's shaped in a funny and different way, like this, um, so that it provides that same support. It takes up more space, provides support underneath the urethra. The purpose of this is to stop stress leaking, and it's obviously disposable and fairly cheap. So this is something I, is, if you're struggling with this problem and you're just trying to figure out an order of operations to get this done, this is something that you can try before you see me, 
et cetera. If this really addresses your problem, then we're getting a lot closer to really knowing what the answer is. And then we can talk about, you know, all the things that I mentioned, strengthening, pessary, whatever, to kind of address that. So lastly, and I'm gonna wrap up here pretty quickly and then we'll take some questions. Um, you know, are there procedures for stress leaking? There are, uh, and this whole small category are, are, are referred to as incontinent slings. There, historically, there are a lot of other surgeries that have been around to address stress leaking, um, bladder suspensions, bladder neck suspensions which are more involved surgeries. The advent of incontinent slings has been really great. Uh, these have really risen in popularity over the past, you know, more than 20 years at this point. And these are minimally invasive, uh, same day procedures that have amazing success rates at addressing stress leaking specifically. So um, this, I do think these are great and I, I as you can tell, I, I, don't, I don't try to talk people out of surgery, um, but I try to offer a lot of options first. I do, I feel bad when I don't present this option to women who are really struggling with stress incontinence because although it's still important to try the other stuff first, absolutely, these surgeries are, are really effective at addressing stress incontinence. So what these are, are small strips of mesh. And this is permanent mesh. And, and you know, I don't use permanent mesh in any other part of my job except for stress leaking and, and except for incontinent slings. And it briefly is important to note that mesh has had a bad deal in gynecology and, and there are, have been major lawsuits about permanent mesh, um, specifically for different reasons than slings. So the short, version of this is that when we talked about bladder bulges and rectocele's, it was, it used to be far too common in gynecology to fix that by picking the bladder up and putting a big piece of mesh, almost like reconstructing the top wall of the vagina with mesh, or pushing down a rectocele bulge and, fi and fixing the whole posterior wall with mesh. Mesh is very good at a few things. It is long lasting and it's strong. So as a durable fix for a rectocele, for instance, mesh works great. That's not gonna, your, the recurrence of, of your rectocele if they use mesh is very low. But when you use large pieces of mesh like that, the complication rates are too high. There's pain associated with that. There were certainly class action lawsuits. And the FDA recently pulled gyne, uh, prolapse mesh off the shelves, so no one uses it anymore. The FDA evaluated this different use of mesh and evaluated the safety data and said, you can keep that. Safety data for that is acceptable because this is a different use of a very small, thin piece of mesh. It is, it's legitimate to acknowledge that it's permanent and that's a big deal and I take that seriously too, but we're using it in a different way. And so the way that this stops stress leaking is using a very thin strip of mesh to provide support right underneath the urethra in a very specific way that stops stress leaking and is gonna, as I said, be durable and, and long lasting, which is really one of the great things about it. And consequently, because it's such a small amount of mesh, um, the complication rate that was associated with the other uses of mesh is not there with slings, or, and def or definitely not to the degree that it was with prolapse mesh. So that has been deemed to be safe to use. So the idea with that is that when you cough or laugh or run or jump on the trampoline and that pressure is pushed downwards on the bladder, a little bit of new resistance from this sling, the same resistance that the pessary provides, et cetera, prevents urine from coming out, which is why that works. So briefly to talk about it, just the numbers behind the incontinent sling, it is a same day surgery. The, the sling is kind of delivered to the right place via a one centimeter little incision that's just in the top wall of the vagina underneath the urethra. It is a thin strip of permanent mesh. The, the largest conglomeration of numbers regarding this, which is, has been done by the Cochrane Group, which is a great trusted resource for meta-analyses and pulling together many trials, 81 trials with 12,000 women that came together for these numbers show that the success rate, the cure rate, which is dry or very nearly dry, which I know is a major improvement, major for a lot of people, was between 71 and 97%, which is, which is darn good as far as these fixes go. And those numbers were sustained at five years follow up. So, and, and you know, nothing is perfect and I don't wanna act like any surgery is just the perfect thing, but 
The truth is these, these surgeries usually lead to a dramatic, if not complete improvement in stress leaking, and it usually is lasting, um, which I'm happy to be able to say that about anything. There are risks to any procedure, especially ones with mesh. An injury to the urethra or bladder during putting it in is probably on the order of one to 5%. Uh, issues either transiently or longer term, being able to pee and empty your bladder normally after a sling is a real thing. And mesh erosion is, was really the larger problem that was there with prolapse mesh, and that occurs on the order of one, one to 2%. So I, I do wanna present that honestly as a, as a good solution for a lot of women. So that's kind of what I wanted to cover today. I wanna to leave some time for questions. Um, and, and I think at a later time, we really should give another talk on bowel problems and just pain that can be related to these problems. So just as some concluding statements, these problems are absolutely common and very, very undertreated. And I would really, I applaud you guys for tuning into this and just trying to get some more information on it and, and please do reach out to me in any way about how to take next steps after this because they're, they're, as bullet point number two says, there are fixes for this. And the best fixes are the ones that don't involve me doing much doctoring at all. It's just kind of helping us find the right solutions for you to heal yourself. If you do need interventions like pessary, like surgery, there, there are options that really have, that are really quite safe, that have short recoveries and really excellent success. And as always, do your Kegels. So I wanna say thanks again to BCH and JCC and you guys for tuning in. This is my lovely fiance, Helena. And we, I, aside from being, we and me aside from being a physician are goat ranchers and I deliver sometimes just about as many baby goats as I do humans in a given month. So uh, thanks for tuning in. I think we're gonna to switch to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. McNamara. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in right now. Um, are there alternative ways to do a colonoscopy for a person that has only prolapsed during that procedure? Are there alternate ways to do a colonoscopy? So there, there are, and to get the full scoop on this, it, it is a good question to ask your gastroenterologist as well, but there, there, are, there are indeed more than one way to screen for colon cancer. Colonoscopy is only one. Um, uh, there's other procedures called flexible sigmoidoscopy, uh, which is a slightly different um, type of instrument and procedure than colonoscopy. And for the right people, there are, there's a, a CT scan where they can virtually kind of reconstruct images of the colon to screen for colon cancer. And there's also mail out testing, as you may have seen on commercials on TV, where they send you a kit, you send them back a stool sample and they can screen for colon cancer that way. So. The answer is yes, there are other ways to do colon cancer screening um, if you do have issues with either, I don't know if that's rectocele or, or, or rectal prolapse with colonoscopy, so yeah. Does black seed oil, uh, does black seed, aka cumin oil, help with leaky bladder? So I, there are a number of uh, herbal and homeopathic solutions for urgency, for stress incontinence. Um, and for constipation that have been suggested over the years. Um, flaxseed, I've definitely seen as one of the leaders out of things that have been investigated. I, the truth is that they, they haven't, I wish I could say that they have, but they haven't panned out to be as effective as we want them to be in really treating the problem. Do I think it's safe? Absolutely. And it's absolutely worth trying, maybe in conjunction with some of this other stuff, but um, as far as these larger studies go, it hasn't really panned out. When is a hysterectomy needed for vaginal prolapse? So it's a good question. Uh, really, one tenet of how physicians should, ap should approach prolapse is that the, the top of the vagina, the, the, uh, what holds up the uterus, the apex, uh, and prevents uterine prolapse, that is a really foundational part of pelvic floor support. When women lose that and start to develop some aspect of uterine prolapse, um, it, is, it, is, it invariably leads to also developing a cystocele. Uh, that's kind of part and parcel with the comment that a lot of women who have a cystocele as their primary problem also have some degree of uterine prolapse. They're just, this, the, those things are very often connected. So the answer is that if, as part of your presentation, 
there is a lack of support of the uterus, so that the uterus is either coming down as the primary thing or, the, or associated. We do need to, we need to address that to really fix your problem the best way. And so what, what I mean by that is that when there is uterine prolapse or when that's part of the problem, the way that we fix that is with a hysterectomy and then resupporting the top of the vagina in a more purposeful way. Do prolapse surgeries cause back and or pelvic pain? They can. I mean, the, def the fair answer to that is yes, they can. You know, any surgery in the pelvis in the way that we all heal from surgery in terms of developing scar tissue, um, et cetera, can cause that. So I, I think the real answer to that is yeah. You know, the, is, it, is it common to develop a, a chronic situation of pain or lower back pain or pelvic pain following these surgeries? No, is the truth. You know, I think that incidence of that is, is really very low. Um, and I think when some amount of nerve or muscular pain does show up after surgery, and this is kind of true of a lot of different surgeries, it often can be addressed with, it can be addressed and fixed. And, and with pelvic surgery, that's often with something like pelvic PT to try to figure out what is hurting and kind of stretching out scar tissue, that kind of thing. So the fair answer is yeah, I think it's really rare um, and, and it can be addressed if it is there. What sort of test slash scan shows if you have prolapse? How do you detect prolapse, manual exam, or radiology? Right, another good question. So the, the real answer to this is that it, the best way is with a physician in the office. I, 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 it would be more convenient for you guys if there was a, an easier way to do it, but um, by far the best way to do that is for a trained physician to see you in the office and have you literally bear down and push so that we can see what moves and how. And there's, there is not a good CT scan that replicates that is the truth. So the, it's been looked at using ultrasound and dynamic ultrasound with women bearing down during an ultrasound exam. Um, and uh, CT and MRI have been used and studied for the evaluation of prolapse. They, they are helpful sometimes to evaluate complicated prolapse in terms of someone who's had procedures in the past and we really need a better understanding of, of a complicated situation. But the truth is that's not the best or the right way to evaluate prolapse in most people, especially women who are just trying to get it figured out for the first time. So it's really coming to see the, a doctor. Do you feel vaginal estrogen is safe for hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients? Vaginal estrogen, I think, yeah. So that's a good question too. That, the question was, is vaginal estrogen safe for patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer? And the, you know, I, first disclaimer, I 100% of the time want to include your oncologist in that conversation. Um, but what I can tell you is my impression from the data and what most oncologists do um, agree with also is that the safety data from vaginal estrogen shows that the systemic absorption of, the, of that hormone is, is not zero, but it's very, very low into the bloodstream. And so it has a very limited ability to stimulate receptor positive breast cancer, et cetera. Um, they have done ex really big good studies to evaluate the safety of vaginal estrogen in those patients, and the data from that has been super reassuring. And, and a lot of the larger organizations, the oncology organizations, have, have changed their position on vaginal estrogen for breast cancer patients and said that it can be considered as an option. So, um, you know, but I, it's important to, that is a conversation between me and you and your oncologist and really talking about the risks and benefits of that um, and just making the right decision for you. Does a pelvic PT do pessaries or just gynecologists? Do pessaries, yeah. So it, uh, PTs don't do, in, in general, don't do pessaries. Uh, they are very knowledgeable about pessaries and they can, they really help me and my patients um, troubleshoot issues with their pessaries or, or help them with tricks on how to use them. But the, the process of, of choosing the right pessary for the right patient, the right size, um, and monitoring for um, issues that can arise from using a pessary, which are rare, but getting you know, abrasions or issues from them is something that ultimately needs to be 
done by a doctor. Uh, but they, they, they know a lot about them. They're an extremely helpful part of the team. But to figure out which one is right for you, ultimately you need to see a doc. And Dr. McNamara, we have one last question. Sure. Are there any, vitam are there any vi vitamins or other supplements that are helpful? Vitamins or supplements that are helpful? For? So, for yeah. yeah uh, for, with regard to both prolapse and bladder problems, um, I, I, I take supplements myself. I wish there was a better answer to this, but uh, the truth is that they're, especially in terms of, pro, in, in terms of prolapse, that is a, such a muscular support problem that there isn't a supplement that really helps with that. Um, there, in terms of bladder um, supplements, uh, I think that the, the answer is unfortunately really the same, you know, whether it's flaxseed or cranberry extract or um, oregano oil, or you know, a lot of different things have been evaluated. And um, again, while they're safe, and I think they can provide some benefit for some people, they haven't moved the needle uh, enough in a larger scale. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm someone who's really open to talking about those things, and I would love to work with you guys on which of those might be right for you, but I don't, I, I don't always think it's the, the one fix that we want it to be.